My name is Kelby Gilfoyle. I am a theater maker um, from Cork. Not from Cork. Let's start again. Ask me a question again. <laughs> Ask me again! So since our last interview, since Eureka Springs, um, which was a year and a half ago, um, a lot has happened. I did three plays in that space of time, which is way too many plays for that space of time. But, um, but yeah, it was crazy. We, we, we went to Galway Fringe Festival just after sort of Eureka Springs time. I suppose maybe actually like a, like a few months after it. And we did a play called Happy Slapped. And from there, then we, we did a play called Exit the King in sort of December time. That was sort of an adaptation of this French play by this writer, Eugenie Inesco. And then we spent, I would say, the most half of eight months working on The Imagination of Walter Ray, which was the prime focus of the past year and a half, I guess. And we brought that to... London so that was sort of a big thing um, yeah and it was lots of fun um, I'm working on a new project a new play at the moment it's kind of like a conceptual piece it's very personal it's very much about me um, my life uh, sort of as a creative person and as an individual as a human being um, and it sort of looks at my relationship with my family, with women, with myself, with mental health, with everything, really, love. Um, and it's a two-hander, um, myself and Harriet McAllister, who I worked with on The Imagination of Walter Ray, who's fantastic. And... Yeah, it's, it's really just a conceptual piece at the moment. We're working on it. We're, we're only done one rehearsal so far, so it's just finding its feet, um, finding its footing. So it's going to be cool. It's going to be really, really alternative and really fucked up, um, which is pretty much my brand. <laughs> so got to stick with it. It's called Paradise, and it's coming out in March next year. Um everything like venue and everything like that is yet to be sort of decided um but it's called paradise and yeah it, it's about this guy called lilo um who's sort of a, it's sort of a pseudonym for myself you know but i didn't want to call him kelby so it's about this character lilo who sort of falls in love with his inanimate lamp who is ellie and it sort of chronolo it sort of chronicles their love story or their you know, there's sort of slow demise in a sense. Um, and Harriet plays Ellie live on stage. So it's, it's a bit uh, visceral. It's a bit, it's a bit strange. Um, there's 37 characters in the play altogether. There's two actors. Mayhem. <laughs> you know. So I've worked on a lot of projects and they've all been sort of somewhat different from one another um which i don't think was a conscious decision on my behalf i think it was more of a it happened to be a sort of perfect coincidence in a sense um i don't know with me it's sort of the the script writes itself i don't really have control over that uh which sounds probably really weird to people but that's just the way I work. It sort of writes itself. But yeah, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe sometimes, maybe there's a conscious decision. Like for Walter, I, I stepped out of the, you know, stepped off the boards, so to say, and took the more directorial sort of approach to it. And I knew that that would, in a sense, create a better product. Um, so maybe that's sort of stuff like that is sort of conscious. Yeah. Um, but in terms of story and, you know, the art direction and stuff, it sort of just happens, you know, true creation. So I don't think so. Um, there's a lot of similarities between them too, so, you know. Um, that theater 
and art, I suppose, is essentially storytelling. And that's really all it is from its, you know, from its bare minimums. All you need to do is tell a story and hopefully you tell it well and hopefully people enjoy it or take something from it. And that's sort of my, was my learning uh, from that was that you can, you know, we performed that in a hotel in Shirley, so there was no big fucking, you know, blah de blah sort of thing going on. It was just a hotel in Shirley with no lights and no, you know, a very small set in terms of what it was, but it still happened to work. And I think that was a huge lesson of, you know, sometimes you don't need the, the razzmatazz, but, you know, does it help? Yeah, sure. But, yeah, I mean, that taught me a lot. We did bring that to Cork um, as well, and we brought that to a Fringe Festival in Galway. So that also taught me a lot, how to deal with, you know, before that I hadn't done anything uh, related to theatre. So it allowed me to have that contact with theatre people, with technical managers, with, you know, um, with sort of hiring venues, everything like that, you know, working with LX designers, working with sound ops. Everything like that was just invaluable, I guess, for your first production. You're like, oh, fuck, what does this person do? What does that person do? What's a stage manager? What's a production manager? And you sort of figure all that out. Um, it's messy for your first show. It's always going to be a little bit messy. You don't know really what you're doing. You're just running around trying to piece a puzzle that isn't even, you know, they're creating the puzzle while you're piecing it together. It's one of those fucking things. But no, it was. I learned a lot from that. Yeah, so that was like the, oh, I can do it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll jump off the, the deep end now, do you know? You, you, so that was, that was tough. That was really tough. And I learned a lot, um, a lot from that. A lot of personal stuff too. It's weird, you can create art and you can learn a lot from doing that about yourself. And I think that's one of my biggest takeaways with Eureka Springs is it, it allowed me to have an epiphany on what I wanted to do with my life and where I wanted to go with my life, you know? I remember, um, I remember, this is a weird story, but anyway, I remember being in um, this bar in Trilly called Hennessy's and we were on like the dance floor and I remember Jamie was home for Christmas, I think it was, I can't remember when, but it was maybe 2018 Christmas or something and he like, or was it Christmas? Summer? I think it was summer 2018. And he sort of put me against the wall and he was like, you need to get out of this town. You need to do stuff. And like, it's really interesting. You know, he was like crying and stuff. Um, but like, it did, it was that eye opening in a sense in that like, you can only get so far with art in a certain place that sort of holds you down. Um, and just the people I like to create art with were up here and just the people that understood me more. Like, I love Trelease so much. Like, you know, it's it's great. And I love going home and going back there, seeing everyone. But there is a certain time to say, oh, hello, this new version of the world. <laughs> and I think that's what Eureka Springs did to me. It allowed me to understand that these type of people, people like me, exist. And they're there. And they're wanting to create alongside you. And, and just that respect and that trust that these people were giving me these people that gave me so much trust and so much time like that was a long you you were there for a lot of that it was a long period of time and like four hour rehearsals and you know it's quite a lot and I hadn't done anything other than like before that which they hadn't seen so they were just trusting me on nothing you know what I mean and that was great Happy slapped. Um, <laughs> it taught me about cast and scheduling. That was a huge take back from it, you know, and that sometimes you have to be very careful of who you cast. Um, and when I say that, I don't mean that in a negative sense. I just mean that sometimes they might not be as passionate as you are and you're not paying them. It's a very pro bono system and... You know, that's fucking, you know, you know yourself as a creative, you know, doing stuff for free is great as long as it's your stuff. But doing someone else's stuff for free, fuck off. Do you know what I mean? So you have these people that are doing your stuff 
for free. And yeah, okay, they're they're studying to be an actor or they want to be an actor. So doing something like this is a good thing to do. But then they're just unreliable or flaky or whatever fucking else. And that brings the whole production down. That brings the whole morale down. And, you know, it's important to take that into account moving forward. And scheduling. People could be working till like 11 o'clock and then working in the morning at 9 a.m. And you're like, well, we have to rehearse some stage. You know, we can't just not rehearse. That's ridiculous. So there's a lot of that. Um, but, yeah, I guess that's really... The, and working with puppets is difficult. <laughs> Exit the King was the first play that I adapted in terms of I didn't write it. And why did I choose to do Exit the King as the first adaptation? Um, well, basically, it comes down to that me and Dylan were in London and I had booked tickets on the fly to this play, Exit the King, Risa Fawns was, was in it. Um, Risa Fawns, who played the, the fucking lizard and the amazing Spider-Man. I don't know, he's been in loads of stuff. But um, I, we went to see that, and it was phenomenal, and I really, really enjoyed it. It was like proper fun, you know? I was like, oh, they're having so much fun on stage. And I think I just came out of Happy Slapped, which was quite... It was really fun, don't get me wrong, but it was just it was stressful. And I wanted to do something fun. And the last three plays were quite heavy, you know, in terms of subject matter, in terms of, you know, what they were dealing with. So I was like, I just want to do something fun, just something stupid, something fun. And so I was like, this is the perfect play. And I literally bought the rights the same day as I seen the show, which Dylan didn't like very much. But I did it. Um, it was a ex extremely interesting experience working on something that's not your own. Um, coming from a background of working only on stuff that are, that were my own, um, no, it was good. It was it was a good piece, and I I really did love the piece, so that helped. Um, but my biggest thing I've learned from doing Exit the King was, do not star and direct something you're you're doing because it's fucking mental. And I would tell everyone that's doing anything like that, I'd be like, just don't do it. Don't do it. Surround yourself with a team of people if you want, and then do it. Do you know? If you want to have good ADs or good stage managers or just a good creative team, then fucking go, go for it. Do you know? Take the risk. But like, when everyone's looking at you as the captain, and you're trying to like, because Exit the King was quite a, like I was playing King Berenger, and he was quite an interesting character, and I was giving my all to the performance. But like, I can't give my all to performance while everyone is fucking looking at me. Like, what am I going to, what am I doing? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know. I don't even know what I'm doing. So it's, it's, it's hard. And that was a very wordy play. Like it was, the language was quite difficult to grasp. And a lot of the actors found that to be a challenge. Learning the lines, it was 60 pages, but like, like fucking so much lines to learn. Um, so it was a challenge. It was a real challenge. And we did it in like two months. So don't do a play in two months either. That's also something I've learned. So I stepped outside the, I stepped off the boards, as I said, and I took helm of the ship as director solely of Walter. Um, and I sort of did things a little different this time because Exit the King was kind of a shambles. I mean, let's be honest, it was it was a shambles. It, the show went really well and people didn't know that it was a shambles, but the product, the rehearsals and the production of it were a shambles. So it was like, okay, we're doing Walter now and it's we're going to have to treat this a little differently, a little bit more professionally than we've done before. Um, so we brought in an actual stage manager, an actual assistant director. Um, I was just directing, I wasn't in it. The four actors had nothing to do with the outside creative process. You know, Dylan, of course, was producing alongside me, but that's about it. So everyone else was just solely acting or solely on the crew team. And that, that really made a difference, I think, because it was just easier. You know, there was no fucking jumping back and forth sort of thing. Um, and you can see the performance in front of you. And that's, you know, and I knew when I wrote Walter, I was like, okay, this is very much a crazy play that no one else could have done. And I quite knew that. I was like, okay, I have to do this. There's no one else I'd rather 
it, I wouldn't want to give it to anyone. And so I decided I'd do it myself. Um, and I'm just so happy I did, to be honest, because it would have been, again, it would have, you, you just, you can't do everything. It just doesn't work. You end up crashing. If you do too much, you crash. So you need to have help. And even having a stage manager, key in stage management, and fucking AD, Jake, who was phenomenal. You need those people, you know, Kyle on sound, you know, Aoife Cahill on lights. You need, you need a team. You can't, theater is teamwork. Film is teamwork. It, art is very much individual, but, you know, it's teamwork too. So you just do. You have to sacrifice your integ your your artistic flair or whatever the fuck you want to call it. I'm like, I can do this by myself. Do you know? It's like fuck off. Do you know, no, you can't. You need you need a team, and that's what you learn though. Because I think every artist starts out a little bit fucking up their own ass. Do you know, they're like, oh, I'm I can do it, and you're like, you you what's that? That's rubbish. You're shit. Do you know what I mean? And you always look at someone and you're like, you're fucking shit though, and you think you're amazing, and then it's like then they grow up. And they're like, oh shit, yeah, no, yeah, no, I was, I was shit, but that's because I was up my own ass and doing it, trying to do it by myself. And I'm speaking from a place of love for those people because I was the same way, <laughs> you know. I was up my own ass, and then I learned that you can't do this alone, or you can, but you'll be shit at it, unless you're fucking fantastic at what you do. You're going to be shit at it without someone helping you. You know, it matters like what the medium is, of course, but. For the kind of work that I do, you need a team. You just do. I went on a rant. <laughs>
and I have to like read over it and I'm like, fuck, that's pretty good. Do you know what I mean? Or, or it's, what the fuck was that? Do you know what I mean? There's like no in between. But I just write. I, I don't know. I just, I, I, it's like something takes control of my body and it just happens. Um, and it's sort of beautiful because then no matter if the product is good or not, it's always good. It can't be bad because you let it write you. Do you know what I mean? There's something to that, I think. There's something to like, have you ever seen like a really bad movie or something, but you know there's a lot of love in it? Do you know, you're like, fuck it, they really, like The Room with Tommy Wiseau, like you can see he put so much love in it that even though it's shit, you're like, fuck it, he put some love in that, you know? Now, obviously, the scripts are not like The Room, to be honest. I am better than Tommy Wiseau at writing. I will admit that. Um, you know, I'm not going to be vain, but I'll admit that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's just something special. I think everyone has that thing, though. Do you know what I mean? Everyone has that thing that they love doing that, in a sense, is better than sex. Do you know what I mean? I think so. I hope so. I hope you do. I hope you have something better than sex. Sex is pretty good, though. But you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Kelly. laughs>you know, I, I, like, there's a few people that inspire me, of course, like, everyone has their people, like, Charlie, you know, Kaufman, Charles Bukowski, Michelle Gondry, you know, there's loads of people that inspire me, but in terms of, like, what motivates me, fear, I think, um, rejection, all these things motivate me to keep going, because there's a lot of time growing up, and even now, where I'm told constantly, don't do that, and that pisses me off. I hate the system. I'm not one for the system. It pisses me the fuck off. And I have some people in college, like lecturers, being like, you do too much now, Kelby, to calm down. And I'm like, why? Why the fuck do I need to calm down? Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm like a phoenix. I'm going to fucking fly. And I'm not going to calm down. Because calming down is for quitters. And I ain't, not, I ain't no quitter. So I got to keep going. Because everyone in the world wants to shut you down. Everyone wants to say, shut the fuck up. And stop what you're doing. Because they're too busy downing a pint in some fucking pub. Trying to fucking lick the fucking ass off some girl in the fucking bathroom. And that's fine for them. They can do whatever they want. But for me, I'm going to reach. And if I fail, then yeah, cool, whatever. I'll join you at the pub. But for now, I'm doing this. And a lot of people judge me for that. A lot of people think I'm up my own ass or I'm fucking... Whatever, you know, I've been told a few times, oh, you're up your own ass, Kelby, because uh, why are you doing so much shit? Or, oh, what do you talk so highly of yourself? And I'm like, I never talk so highly of myself, actually. First of all, I never talk about myself unless someone talks to me about me. So that's number one. And number two, yeah, okay, sometimes I am up my own ass. I think what I do is good. And I'm proud of what I do. And I've spent so much money on this. And not that money's a thing. But so much hard work has gone into this and so much love and so much passion that like for someone to sort of shit on that. And as a human race, we do that. Do you know, we shit on someone's art or we shit on someone's thing. You know, we're like, oh, I hate that thing or we mock it or something. But it's like, why do we do that as humans? Why can't we hold each other in an embrace and tell each other that what you're doing is inspiring? It's, you know what I mean? The psyche of it is fucked up when you think about it. But look, that's just the way things are. I'm in a very competitive career path. People, if they're not doing as good as you, they're pissed off. Do you know what I mean? And there's this like, you know, there's people that come see my show sometimes and I'm like, oh, they're, they're really judging this. Oh, they're, do you know what I mean? Because they could be in the industry, you know, they could have a production company. Do you know, there's these new production companies popping up left, right and center and they're doing these shows and I'm like, they come see my shit and they're like, you can see them like, and I'm like, all right, do you know what I mean? Enjoy it. It's there to be enjoyed. I do too for one reason only. It's fun. That's it. There is no other reason. And that's what we built Kiska Productions on. And that's always what it comes back to. Is it fun? And if the answer is yes, then we do it. If the answer is no, then we don't. Why would we? What, to, so someone can wank us off? Kiss our ass? No, fuck off. I could do that myself. I don't need that. I just want to have fun. And I think that's the only reason why I do it.
So yeah, so Kisco consists of four people. Myself, Dylan Harris, Kyle Moss, and Leon Danza. Um, why those four people? Or why us four people? Um, we just get on. We're friends. We're best friends. We're always together. And I think there's a good... There's a good spread between the four of us. You know, we're, we're all good at different things, but we're also good, at, you know, at similar things. And we also have a different way of thinking. All four of us are, are different, but similar. And I think that's important. Um, and I think, again, the fundamental thing is we have fun together. We can play and we trust one another. And we know that they're always there for support. And I think that's the most important thing is because you know yourself, you write something and you think, oh, this is good. And then they're like, nah, this, is, this could be better. Or maybe this idea, you should go for that one. Maybe not that one, go for this one. You know, and that sort of thing. And we, we really, like, I share my ideas with all three of them all the time. And they're the people who I sit up late at night with till like 2, 3 a.m. with a few drinks and, and I smoke and, and, and that's it. Do you know what I mean? They're the people I want to work with, the people I enjoy being around. Because this work involves being around people a lot of the time. Do you know, for ages, for months. So, like, I want to work with people that I want to be with, you know. Um, sorry. But um, they're also really interesting. We're all distinct in our vision of where we want to go. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I just, I love those guys. And, you know, there could, there's other people who I also love who are just not part of the production company. And that's for no reason other than, you know, t too many cooks spoils the brat sort of shit. And, you know, we do want, we, we would love female, you know, creators more. That's always something we talk about. You know, female writers or female directors. It, 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 there's, there's this thing of having too many male voices in a room. We really try to stop that. We want to do our productions and we want to make sure to have as many female voices on the crew as we can. Now, it's hard uh, sometimes because there is the four of us in the production company and we're all four males. So it does tend to take up most of the room because there's four of us. But I think that's something we want to get better at. Like Megan Halley now directed, who's one of my best friends. I absolutely fucking love her. Um, she directed Happy Slap. We brought Happy Slap back for Electric Picnic and she directed that and you know, she was phenomenal. And, you know, I love that even, letting someone direct a piece of my writing. That was interesting. That was so fun. I'd love to do that more. But, you know, there's not many people who I trust in doing that. Um, so it's a tricky game, isn't it? I don't know. I don't think like that. My brain doesn't doesn't work like that, unfortunately. Um, you know, I just think that with me, and again, may sound narcissistic, but I don't give a fucking rat's ass. But um, where do you want to go? Doesn't doesn't apply. It's when I'm gonna get there. And yeah, that sounds narcissistic, and I get that. But for too long, everyone didn't fucking believe in me. And I took that on board and I was like, oh shit, maybe I don't believe in myself. You know, maybe they're fucking right. But now, now I don't give a fuck. Now I am going to make it because there is no other way because I believe in myself and it's working. Do you know what I mean? There's like, there, it's working. Um... My goal for, for this year is we're working on a new show and I can't say anything about it because it's in production, but it's for fringe festivals and we want to go international yet again. We want to hit, we're looking at different ones. We don't know which ones we're going to go into yet. It's all preliminary, but maybe Ed Fringe, maybe. We also want to maybe hit Prague or Amsterdam. We want to go abroad. We always want to expand and, and move further. I'm writing a lot of TV pilots at the moment. Um, yeah, I, I would love to get into TV. I love TV. 
with a passion. I just, I, I really enjoy the medium. Um, but my big dream, I guess, the one that I'm like, I'd love to, that's, that's on the top of the list is I want to perform one of my shows in the National Theatre. I, I would love that. That'd be amazing. Myself. Definitely. Myself. I, 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 from the outset, I think I'll, well, I don't know. <laughs> People are probably, like I was about to say, from the outset, I look quite, you know, okay. Or quite bubbly or whatever. But I was going to say bubbly, but then I was like, no one's going to think I'm bubbly. Um, but there's just this darkness that eats away at me. And I've been trying to figure out what that is. And I've been trying to be more um, proactive in it, in the search for that emptiness. But it, it's difficult. Most creatives are uh, not whole, you know. They're empty. There's something inside them that they need to fill, but it's impossible to fill it. And we try with meaningless sex and love and drugs and you know, drink, but it's, it's hard, it's hard to fill that. And no matter what you do, it doesn't fill. And you hold yourself back a lot, I do anyway, is um, I never really think I'm good enough. I know I talk from a place of I'm, I'm proud of what I've done, and of course I am, and I know I'm gonna make it. I, I, I always have that attitude, you, I know I'm gonna make it. Because, fuck it man, no one else is gonna have that response for me you know what I mean no one else is gonna be like oh you're gonna make it Kelsey I, I have to have it for myself someone has to have it for me and if it has to be me then fuck it even if I'm pretending half the time because I am pretending half the time because deep down I'm like shit I don't know if I'm good there's so many people doing this how do I stand up? how am I good I could be shit I could be rubbish at this and that's what holds me back is that that thing eating at my head of being like oh I don't want to wake up today do you know what I mean because I'm not good enough or nobody loves me. And that kind of sucks because it's not true. But that's just the inner struggle I have with myself that I know I need to make strides in, you know, getting better with that. And I think you see a lot of that in my plays. Um, you see a lot of that struggle or that search for something. A lot of the times happiness. It exists prominently as the main focus of a lot of my plays, if not all of my plays, because that, that, that interests me so fucking much, do you know? Um, so yeah. Number one, just do it. Even if it's shit, just do it. Your first thing is never gonna be good, and it's never going to be what you want it to be. And that's okay. You know? Um, number two, the audience doesn't matter. Don't worry about them. Worry about you. Worry about what you want to do and what stories you want to tell and why you want to tell them. That's super important. Um, there's no point telling a story you don't want to tell because like, let someone else tell that story. You, you, you just do what you want to do. You know, uh, three, figure your style out. What's your style? What do you like to do? What's your approach to it, you know? You know, distinguish yourself. You know, stand out from the crowd because that's what it's about. You can't just be, if you're the same as everyone else, then you're never going to do anything. Like if you're, the, if you're like a film director and your style is the Steven Spielberg style, he already exists, pal. Move on. And he's better than you already. So if that's your style, then you're screwed. Do you know what I mean? You find your own style. Obviously, be inspired. And that, that's number four. Be inspired by anything and everything. Listen to music, read books, watch movies, watch TV shows. And don't just watch it. Watch it. You know, get inspired by what they're doing in the background. What's the art style? What's the, you know, the set like? What's the, what, take all this in. What's the dialogue? You know, why, why does like in Charlie Kaufman's um, Being John Malkovich, why is there like... A half floor, you know, what's that represent? Why is he doing that? You know, read scripts. You can find them online. The, it, research is important. Um, and I guess you're not going to be good at it straight away. And don't expect yourself to be. Um, 
surround yourself with like-minded people and don't quit. Don't stop. Everyone's going to tell you to stop. And that's just the nature of being human. Everyone is going to want you to do something different. Everyone is going to tell you that there's no money and there's no future in what you're doing. And they could be right. But they also could be wrong. And also, this is a big one for me personally, get a job. You're going to hate it, but get a job. Use that money to advance your art. It's really important. Don't be an artist that takes money from mommy and daddy. No one's going to respect you for that. I don't know, I was passionate there. <laughs> but I'm only passionate because I care. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I'm not like, people might look at this and say, oh, you're very up your own ass, aren't you? But, um, no, I just think, I care about what I do. And I think you have to care about what you do. Because otherwise, why would you do it? And there's too many people who are afraid to stand up and say, this is the way I'm going to do things. This is who I am. You need to know that. You need to know who you are. I do it all the time. People hate me for it. Do you know what I mean? Like we, we do stuff in school where they're like, oh, write a journal, write about your work. I never write about the work. And I tell them, I'm like, look, I'm not writing about the work. I don't care. I'm gonna write whatever I want to write. And they're just, they have to, they, they respond really well to it. Cause they're like, fuck, he's being honest. He's being real, he's being truthful. That's great. Too many people are just bullshitting their way through shit, man. I couldn't be asked bullshitters now at this stage. Do you know what I mean? People who are like, oh my God. Go away. Seriously, leave me alone. Um, do the impossible because you can. And I'll leave you with that. Me giving out to people. <laughs> oh, Kelby. Am I crazy? Tell me I'm crazy.